Welcome back everybody, Mike Fave here. Today I'm going to do the second part of the Randall cycle. So my previous Randall cycle video that I did titled the Randall cycle, if you don't know, now you know, was just covering the inhibition of glucose oxidation by fatty acid oxidation. So today I'm gonna do the second part or the second side of the Randall cycle, which is the inhibition of fatty acid oxidation by glucose oxidation, we're gonna talk about what some of those mechanisms are um, and what kind of adjusts those different mechanisms. So this, the title of today's presentation is Randall Cycle Part Two. If you didn't know, now you really know. And I'm gonna use a couple studies here. I'm gonna go more, I'm gonna use more than just the a Randall Cycle, or the Randall Cycle uh, revisited a new head for an old hat. That was a study that I used in the previous video. Um, but I'm going to use a couple different studies here because there's that study didn't go over all of the mechanisms. It kind of glossed over some of them, uh, went in depth on others. It's quite an in-depth paper. So there's, there's actually still more in that paper that I want to go over and discuss. But today I just want to focus on the, a little bit about the fatty acid oxidation side because it, it, it plays a role in the, the glucose, uh, inhibition of fatty acid oxidation, kind of like why, what, one piece happens in one scenario and another piece happens in another scenario. So we're going to cover a lot of that as well, but we're just going to cover the second part. And then later on in another video, we'll probably go through that whole Randall cycle revisited paper, a new head for an old hat, you go through that whole deal and uh, break down the different mechanisms in there. There's like a lot of genetic regulation that can be discussed. And then there's also a layers of hormonal regulation to be discussed as well. So there's, quite a bit more depth to the Randall cycle than just what's going on in the mitochondria. I mean, that's the key element. That's the key focus overall, but there's other layers grafted on top of that. So I'm going to just, again, I'm going to try to keep it to this, um, just to the glucose inhibition of fatty acid oxidation today. So we're going to start out with a quote. Uh, this is from the Randall cycle revisited paper. They say here, Increase in circulating glucose stimulates its uptake. The resulting increase in fructose 2,6-biphosphate stimulates glycolysis and leads to pyruvate production and its mitochondrial oxidation through the pyruvate-induced inhibition of PDK and the ensuing activation of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Acetyl-CoA can then be oxidized in the citric acid cycle after condensation with oxaloacetate and its transformation into citrate. However, some of the citrate escapes oxidation is transported to the cytosol where it inhibits both phosphofructose kinases, but also regenerates acetyl-CoA, which in turn may be carboxylated to malonyl-CoA by acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Malonyl-CoA inhibits carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, which controls the entry and oxidation of long chain fatty acids in mitochondria. By this mechanism, glucose-derived malonyl-CoA prevents the futile oxidation of newly formed fatty acids and favors fatty acid esterification. So if this was a whole bunch of mumbo jumbo to you, don't worry. I'm going to go through this in the graphics and show you exactly what they're talking about here. Um, but the first, so I'll, I'll kind of explain it a little bit and then I'll go to the graphic. Basically what they're saying is when glucose is uptake into the cell, it goes through glycolysis. So there's glycolysis and then there's the, there's oxidative or the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle, and then the, to the electron transport chain. Those are the three main areas to know for glucose oxidation. But in glycolysis, fructose 2,6-biphosphate is an e intermediary in glycolysis. It further stimulates glycolysis. And then the end product of glycolysis is py pyruvate. Um, that pyruvate can then move into the citric acid cy cycle uh, through pyruvate dehydrogenase, and it can lead to the formation of NADH and FADH2s, which is what we ultimately want to happen, which goes to the electron transport chain. Now, as we talked about in the first video, pyruvate inhibits uh, py pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase. Um, and what pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase does is pyruvate dehydrogenase kinase blocks pyruvate dehydrogenase. So blocking a blocker activates. So blocking the enzyme that uh, that inhibits another enzyme activates that enzyme or allows that enzyme to function. And so what winds up happening after that is when pyruvate goes through pyruvate dehydrogenase, acetyl-CoA is produced. Acetyl-CoA can then move into the citric acid cycle. It gets converted into ox uh, oxaloacetate and citrate. And then that's 
So what they talk about here, this isn't 100% how it works. This They gloss over. So they have a reference showing that some citrate escapes being oxidized or moved through the, the Krebs cycle and goes to the cytosol. And they say where it inhibits both phosphofructose kinase but also regenerates acetyl-CoA. Um, my, I think that there's, there had, there would have to be a certain threshold or a certain level where the phosphofructose kinases would be significantly inhibited by the buildup of citrate in the cytosol. The problem is, is that this, when, during carb oxidation, and we're going to go through this in a second, when citrate moves to the cytosol, it gets shunted to malonyl CoA, which they talk about here. And then that malonyl CoA basically inhibits this transporter called carnitine palmitoyl transferase, which brings fats into the mitochondria. So oxidizing glucose essentially inhibits fats from getting oxidized in the mitochondria and shuttles them or shunts them towards fatty acid storage. Um, so I, with this element here, I wouldn't 100% agree with this, that there's an inhibition of phosphofructose kinase with glucose oxidation. Perhaps if you had a large, like an, a very large bolus, but I think that there's more to the story and we're going to talk about that now. So this quote describes this next graph here. So this is the general mechanisms by which glucose inhibits fatty acid oxidation. And this is a graph. It's from that same paper, the Randall cycle revisited a new head for an old hat. So what you're seeing here is glucose. Oh, this over here is extracellularly. Um, it comes into the cell. This is the cell cytosol, this orange area. So it comes in through GLUT4 or or they also have hexokinase here. It gets converted to glucose 6-phosphate, which moves through the phosphofructose kinases, and then there's fructose 6-phosphate as well. Um, that eventually moves through glycolysis here and is converted to pyruvate. Now that pyruvate enters the mitochondria, and then it moves through pyruvate dehydrogenase and is turned into acetyl-CoA. Now, acetyl-CoA then moves into the Krebs cycle. So I'm just going to show skip here really quick just to show you. So... There's pyruvate. Here's pyruvate dehydrogenase. This is the enzyme. Pyruvate dehydrogenase uses NAD and a coenzyme A with a pyruvate and turns that pyruvate and those other pro those other substrates into acetyl CoA, and then that acetyl CoA is turned into citrate through citrate synthase. So this is that's what this is describing here, and it also is showing us like a very brief summary of glycolysis. So glucose comes in the cell through GLUT4, moves through glycolysis, converted to pyruvate. Pyruvate is shuttled into the mitochondria where pyruvate dehydrogenase takes that pyruvate and other substrates, which is NAD, um, NAD, and then also the CoA that we saw here and turns it into acetyl-CoA. That acetyl-CoA is turned into citrate. Now, that citrate moves through the Krebs cycle. So as we can see here, citrate will move through the Krebs cycle. It gets turned into um, uh, aconitate, deisocitrate, alpha-ketoglutarate. So there's a, there's a process where citrate gets moved through all these enzymes. All these intermediaries are produced, and you wind up getting uh, oxal acetate, which then combines with acetyl-CoA again and forms citrate. So that's why it's called a cycle. It's a cyclical event. Um, and then eventually these, what you're doing with the cycles producing these, these carriers, NADH, and then there's FADH2. Those go to the electron transport chain. We'll talk about that in just a sec. So that's when you have glucose, that's what you want. That's what happens or what you want to happen under normal circumstances. The glucose moves all the way through, turn to citrate, citrate goes through the Krebs cycle, and then the carriers are created. They go to electron transport chain. Now, some citrate will escape moving fully through the Krebs cycle and it can move back out of the mitochondria into the cell cytosol. So that's where we see the citrate here. And now the citrate doesn't build up in glucose oxidation. Why? So there's these, this enzyme here, it's called ATP citrate lyase. That ATP citrate lyase is going to take that buildup of citrate and convert it to acetyl-CoA. Now, this is acetyl-CoA inside the cytosol. That is different from acetyl-CoA inside the mitochondria. Um, so this acetyl-CoA then also interacts with another enzyme called acetyl-CoA carboxylase and creates malonyl-CoA. Now, malonyl-CoA in turn inhibits carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1. So this is a transporter that takes these long, so these long chain fatty acyl CoAs, so takes fats essentially, and brings them into the mitochondria. And then the malonyl-CoA also helps to upregulate fatty acid synthase, which converts 
these long chain fatty acid CoA's back into triglycerides. So this glucose oxidation, the citrate from glucose oxidation winds up inhibiting to a large extent fatty acid oxidation via the product malonyl CoA. And the citrate doesn't actually really inhibit phosphofructose kinases that much. So in the fatty acid oxidation episode, something that we looked at is that citrate is an allosteric modulator, meaning that it binds onto the enzyme and impairs its function. Well, in this case, it impairs its function. So the citrate doesn't get a chance to build up in the glucose oxidation because it can move through these enzymes to produce malonyl CoA. So you're not going to get a buildup of citrate to inhibit these quite as much because the citrate is going to flow in this direction. Now, there's regulation of these enzymes, ATP citrate lyase and acetyl CoA carboxylase. We're going to talk about that as well. The other thing I want to um, bring up, and we're going to talk about that in a second, is that with glucose oxidation, the chain, there's a change in NADH to FADH2 ratio with a greater with an increase in NADH, which increases the movement of NADH across the um, complex one in the electron transport chain, and also the pyruvate and the the flow of that citrate through the Krebs cycle, and then the subsequent change in that NADH to FADH2 ratio, and then in, leading to also an increase in NAD to NADH ratio, creates a feed forward reaction that activates pyruvate dehydrogenase, um, and then also has has lowers reactive oxygen species to some extent, so which could possibly block econotase, and then increases the flow of uh, substrate and, and uh, electrons through the electron transport chain in comparison to fatty acids would decrease ROS with that glucose oxidation. So the glucose has like a feed forward reaction in terms of ATP production and pushing substrate through the Krebs cycle and the electron transport chains to some extent compared to fatty acids. And that's going to also it lead to less buildup of this citrate um, to a large extent. So what we're going to talk about here is we're going to just revisit very quickly the, the effect of fatty acids on glucose oxidation because this is, this is what sets the stage for the, the fatty acids inhibition of glucose oxidation. And then we see the reverse inside the glucose oxidation's inhibition of fatty acid oxidation. So I just want to cover this because kind of the opposite happens. So what they say is Randall demonstrated that impairment of glucose metabolism by fatty acid or ketone body oxidation was mediated by the short-term inhibition of several glycolytic steps, namely glucose transport and phosphorylation, 6-phosphofructose kinase 1, and pruvate dehydrogenase. So just quickly so I can show you, and we talked about this previously, but fatty acids lead to a buildup of citrate. That buildup of citrate blocks fossil fructose kinase 1, which builds up glucose 6-phosphate and inhibits uh, GLUT4 and hexokinase. And then the buildup of acetyl-CoA from fatty acids and, and then also um, the build up, subsequent buildup of citrate, etc., all have a negative effect on pruvate dehydrogenase. And then the change in NADH to NAD uh, ratio also has a negative effect on pruvate dehydrogenase. So they say the extent for the, they continue the quote here, the extent of inhibition is graded and increases along the glycolytic pathway being most severe at the level of pyruvate dehydrogenase and less severe at the level of glucose uptake and fossil fructose kinase. This sequence occurs because the initial event triggered by fatty acid oxidation is an increase in the mitochondrial ratios of acetyl-CoA to CoA and NADH to NAD+, both of which inhibit pyruvate dehydrogenase activity. So in fatty acid oxidation, this increase in acetyl-CoA content in ratio to CoA and in the increase in NADH in ratio to NAD+, alters the uh, function of pyruvate dehydrogenase and basically blocks uh, glucose or pyruvate's movement through pyruvate dehydrogenase. Um, and then you can get a, the buildup of acetyl-CoA and citrate, which enters into here, and then the citrate will build up here. Now, the reason citrate doesn't flow to a malonyl-CoA in that situation is because with fatty acid oxidation, there's blocks at acetyl-CoA carboxylase or ATP citrate lyase and acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So these enzymes aren't working when you're oxidizing fatty acids to the same extent that they are when you're oxidizing glucose. So citrate won't flow there. And what citrate will do is build up in the cytosol and inhibit the phosphofructose kinase enzymes, which leads to a buildup of this glucose 6-phosphate here that blo that leads to, to some extent, a small, a very small, I think they said 20 to 30% inhibition of flux at hexokinase and GLUT4. Now, what they 
t- furthermore, what they talk about here with the block at Pruvate dehydrogenase is dedicated mitochondrial kinases, Pruvate dehydrogenase kinase, phosphorylate, and activate Pruvate dehydrogenase. Then they talk about the phosphatases. I'm not interested in talking about those right now. So just know Pruvate dehydrogenase kinase gets in- inhibits Pruvate dehydrogenase as well. And then Pruvate dehydrogenase substrates and products also control pr- this Pruvate dehydrogenase kinase activity. So pyruvate or its analog dichloroacetate inhibits, whereas acetyl-CoA and NADH stimulate pruvate dehydrogenase kinase with isoform-specific differences in sensitivity. So I'm going to go back here really quick. The products of pyruvate dehydrogenase, so acetyl-CoA and then also from fatty acid oxidation, as we talked about in the first Randall cycle video, the buildup of NADH will lead to a blockage of pyruvate dehydrogenase and through multiple mechanisms by leaving not enough uh, CoA and NAD plus for pruvate dehydrogenase to function. But then also the acetyl CoA will inhibit the pruvate dehydrogenase as well. And then those, the products here, NADH and and acetyl CoA will also activate pruvate dehydrogenase kinase, which blocks this pruvate, blocks pruvate dehydrogenase. Why is this important? Well, with fatty, with glucose oxidation, when the glucose is coming in, The pyruvate dehydrogenase is working with the buildup of pyruvate, which stimulates pyruvate dehydrogenase. And then with the, with glucose oxidation, you're not going to necessarily have that alteration in the NADH to FADH2 ratio, which lead, which will allow NADH to be used at the electron transport chain. So you'll have adequate NAD for pyruvate to function, pyruvate dehydrogenase to function appropriately. So glucose has like this continuous flux through, it'll move through nicely it doesn't get that buildup of ROS necessarily like you see with fatty acid oxidation. It's not the same context. Um, and then you then like prove dehydrogenase works well, and you're not going to get that same buildup of the acetyl CoA or and then the subsequent citrate. And then the citrate that does escape will flow to malonyl CoA. So you're not really getting that same backlog that you do with fatty acid oxidation. You're kind of getting the opposite. Pruvate dehydrogenase isn't blocked. Phosphofructose kinase isn't blocked. There's not that buildup of glucose 6-phosphate that then leads to a small uh, decrease in flux at GLUT4 and hexokinase. Those glucose is actually able to flow through nicely. What you're seeing now instead is fatty acids aren't flowing into the mitochondria. They're just being shunted towards uh, triglyceride or fatty fat synthesis. So this, the glucose gets oxidized and the fats sort of get stored. Um, so you're seeing like the almost the opposite of what you were seeing with fatty acid oxidation where the fats were coming in leading to this buildup of, a, of acetyl-CoA and the blockage of pruvate dehydrogenase. And then the buildup of cit- the citrate moving into the uh, the cytosol, which blocks fossil fructose kinase, etc. All of this now with glucose, things just run kind of smoothly through the mitochondria, um, and then the fats just get shunted towards storage instead of being oxidized. So it's a it's like a, it's an opposite process to a large extent. There's not as much of a jam. Now, what I had with this picture here is I just wanted to reiterate something pretty important was. And we're going to get into it in just a sec with a, a reverse electron transport and the alterations in NADH, NAD, uh, NAD ratio and NADH to FADH2 ratio with fatty acid oxidation. But the if we look here again, pruvate dehydrogenase requires NAD plus to function. Malate dehydrogenase requires NAD plus. Isocitrate dehydrogenase requires NAD plus. Alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase requires NAD plus. So when you have fatty acid oxidation, as I discussed in the pr- first Randall cycle video, the you get this excess NADH. You get a buildup of these reductive, reduced products, and then you don't have enough NAD to, for these enzymes to function. The other thing that happens is when you have this buildup of acetyl-CoA here, um, you don't have the CoA for pruvate dehydrogenase to function appropriately. And then the other thing that happens is those products will also inhibit, inhibit pruvate dehydrogenase. So with the glucose, you're not, we actually have a better NAD plus to NADH ratio because of how it's oxidized. And that's what I'm going to discuss now. So I just wanted to bring this to show you guys here and for what I was discussing before. So what we're talking about here is shift in NADH to NAD plus ratio with carb oxidation versus fat oxidation leads it. So there's an unblocking of pruvate dehydrogenase. That's what I was just describing. Um, so when you have, I'm going to read the quote, but I'll discuss and I'll discuss briefly before when you oxidize glucose, you have a better NAD plus to NADH ratio. I mean, you have more NAD overall. 
than NADH compared comparatively to fatty acid oxidation. Um, and then you also have a better NADH to FADH2 ratio. And that both of those things go hand in hand. And we're going to discuss that, why that is in a second. But this allows for the Krebs cycle to work and the pyruvate dehydrogenase to work a bit better because you have adequate NAD for those enzymes that I just discussed to function appropriately. So what they say here is oxidation of, um, oxidation of glucose produces NADH and FADH2 with five NADH molecules being oxidized for each molecule of FADH by the, res by the respiratory chain. So when you oxidize glucose, you have, a, you have five um, NADH molecules for each molecule of FADH2 being oxidized at the respiratory chain. We're going to see why that's important in a second. When fatty acids are oxidized, the ratio of NADH to FADH2 changes to 2 to 1, which results in an over-reduction of the CoQ, uh, coenzyme Q pool and an increase in reverse electron flow and ROS generation. In these conditions, reverse electron flow, ROS generation promotes the, de the degradation of complex 1, increasing the association between complex 3 and complex 4, which is more efficient for the, fat, for the oxidation of fatty acids. So what they're saying is that, and we're going to see, I'm going to show you a graphic, but when you have this increased ratio of FADH2 to NADH, so with fats, you have a 2 to 1 NADH to FADH2 ratio. With carbohydrates, you have a 5 to 1 NADH to FADH2 ratio. Um, what winds up happening is that Complex 2 gets activated stronger than complex 1. So we'll go over here. So the FADH2, you see a complex 2, or let me just start over for this. So this is the, the cell membrane, or the not the cell membrane, the mitochondrial membrane. This is complex 1, complex 2, complex 3, complex 4. Here's coenzyme Q. Now, coenzyme Q takes the electrons from complex 1 and complex 2 and brings them to complex 3. The electrons for complex 1 come from NADH. The electrons from complex 2 come from FADH2. If you have a higher ratio, so you have a 5 to 1 NADH to FADH2 ratio, you're going to have a lot more of the electrons from NADH2 moving through CoQ10. So co or coenzyme Q is able to associate better with complex 1. So that's in your carb situation. In your carbs, you're going to have 5 to 1 ratio to the large extent of NADH to FADH2. Now on the opposite side with fats, if you're oxidizing fats, you're going to have a 2 to 1 NADH to FADH2 ratio. This is going to lead to more association of coenzyme Q with complex 2. So then this complex 1 is not able to effectively like take the electrons from NADH and move them to coenzyme Q because it's stuck over here at complex 2. That's the problem with, the, with fatty acid oxidation is from this ratio. What winds up happening is that NADH here, you get this buildup of NADH. You get a larger amount of NADH in ratio to NAD because the NADH is unable to, to, leap, to drop its electrons off at complex 1 uh, because the complex 1 is already jammed up with electrons because it can't move it through, through coenzyme Q. The other thing that happens, you get something called reverse electron flow. I'm going to show you that in just a second. So just to reiterate here, with fatty acid oxidation, you get a you get a 2 to 1 NADH to FADH2 ratio. This leads to complex 2 hogging coenzyme Q. With glucose oxidation, you have a 5 to 1 NADH to FADH2 ratio. This leads to complex 1 being able to associate better with, with coenzyme Q and allows NADH to drop off its electrons and come back and be NAD plus and H plus so that you have more NAD to be recycled back to these enzymes so that they can take this NAD and form NADH. So it helps to inhibit this block at pyruvate dehydrogenase plus the glucose coming through creates pyruvate, which simulates pyruvate dehydrogenase, et cetera. So you have less of these roadblocks because you have adequate NAD now because you have a better NAD plus to NADH ratio because complex one is able to you drop off electrons from NADH and create that NAD. So that's the, that's the opposite. That's the flip and carb oxidation versus fat oxidation, and why you don't see this math, this increased buildup of citrate because of this blockage to, to some extent at approved dehydrogenase. You're not seeing that in carbs. You're seeing that more with fats. Um, and then we'll talk about what happens in the cytosol in just a few minutes. But what I want to discuss here is uh, the shift in NADH to NAD plus ratio with carb oxidation versus fat oxidation, unblocking of approved dehydrogenase. This is specifically the reverse electron flow. So this here is, 
is another example of the electron transport chain. This gray area here is the, the mitochondrial membrane. This is the inner mitochondrial space. And what's happening here is the, this is complex one. Here's complex two, complex three, complex four, complex five. The other picture didn't have complex five. It's not necessary for what we're talking about at the moment. Um, but essentially what they're showing here is that reverse electron transport flow or reverse electron transport. Yeah. So you have coenzyme Q here, which you, goes to both complex two and complex one. When you have a large amount of that FADH2, that as we talked about in this picture, the FADH2, when you have that altered ratio where you only have a two to one NADH to FADH2 ratio, complex two starts to hog coenzyme Q here. These all these little electrons are the coenzyme Q is an electron carrier, so it's they're showing you where all the electrons can come from. So what happens is when with this when this happens, complex two hogs coenzyme Q. The NADH tries to drop off its electrons at complex one. What winds up happening is the electrons aren't able to move effectively to coenzyme Q. So they start to, they start to form hydrogen peroxide um, or superoxide, which eventually gets turned into hydrogen peroxide. So they start to form reactive oxygen species, but these electrons coming off of complex one. Um, and that's the that's essentially this reverse electron flow. So the the complex one isn't moving these electrons to coenzyme Q. Why is this important? What does this mean? What is this reverse electron flow? So with carboxidation, you wouldn't have this because you would have adequate NADH in ratio to FADH2, as we saw in the previous graph, which would allow coenzyme Q to take the electrons effectively to complex three from both of the different complexes. Okay, no problem. Now this ROS creates a problem with fatty acid oxidation because what winds up happening is the ROS signals, uh, the, the ROS number one can damage the mitochondrial membrane and the different structures, but it also is a signaling effect where it can say, hey, we have a lot of this ROS coming from complex one, so now we need to uncouple, so we're gonna decrease that ATP production. Um, why, how does this happen? So you have this H plus, these proton gradients, so these are all the little H plus ions are moved by these different complexes into this mitochondrial inner, inner lumen, and what winds up happening is the uh, another enzyme comes in. It's called a uncoupling protein, and it dissipates the H plus ions so that it allows these to, to get rid of this ROS. It allows the electrons to effectively flow with dissipating these different H plus ions in the form of heat. So with fatty acid oxidation, you get this increased ROS, but then this gradient that you're trying to produce here with the H plus ions so that you can produce ATP at complex five, so complex five takes the H plus ions, and then it it uh it allows them to flow through. And when they flow through, it uses the energy of them flowing through to convert uh adenine diphosphate to ATP or adenine triphosphate. So this is the energy. This is our the form of energy that we use in our body. And essentially, what happens is the uncoupling protein will remove that. It'll remove these protons. It'll decrease the ROS so that we can protect the mitochondria. But then you have decreased ATP production. That's a problem. So what you're seeing, and they, they, they talk about this in this article. I have to put the source here. I'll actually put it in the description of the video. But fatty acid oxidation uses more oxygen and produces less ATP than carb oxidation. Um, it also generates less CO2. And we'll t I'll talk about that in a separate video. But this is problematic because you need CO2 to uptake oxygen uh, effectively through the Bohr and Haldane effects, um, which is an, the alteration of hemoglobins binding with the different gases based on their environment. So the different environments lead to different uptakes or affinity of the hemoglobin molecule for the different gases. So what's happened, the reason I wanted to show this, I know it's a little complicated overall, um, just with this like funny looking graph and all that or graphic, but it's really important that the, it's really important to understand that with carb oxidation, you're generating more ATP and you have less, you have more ATP per unit of oxygen because you don't have this reverse electron transport flow because you don't have that altered ratio of NADH to FADH2. Um, the other thing is you don't get that same level of buildup of citrate inside the in the cytosol of the mitochondria. So that's I put this graphic here just to describe that again. With the fatty acid oxidation, you're not getting that buildup of citrate. You're not getting that blockage at pruvate dehydrogenase. You're not really... Uh, I'm, with the carb oxidation, I'm sorry, you're not getting this super high buildup of citrate. Any of the citrate that you have is flowing through these enzymes. 
Prove AD hydrogenase is working well. Citrate is able to flow through the Krebs cycle well. There's not these blocks because you don't have you're not missing this uh, the NAD necessary for these enzymes to function appropriately. Um, you're not getting the ROS that's leading to a loss of the proton gradient and a decreased amount of ATP for the substrate that you're using. So the carb oxidation things are kind of flowing a little bit better. Uh, and then any, uh, also any citrate that does move to the cytosol doesn't really stay long as citrate. It gets converted all the way, all the way to malonyl CoA through these enzymes, ATP citrate lyase and acetyl CoA carboxylase. Now I'm going to talk about the next section here is talking about what's going on in the cytosol with these different enzymes with fat oxidation versus carb oxidation. Um, in fat oxidation, these enzymes, acetyl -CoA, uh, ATP citrate lyase and acetyl CoA carboxylase, are are basically turned down. They're blocked, so it allows citrate to to accumulate, and then that citrate can then block phosphofructose kinase one and two, and then doesn't really. There's not a it's not a block. It's a or a partial block, a level of inhibition. It's not a hundred percent. I think it's like forty to sixty percent, and then GLUT4 and hexokinase at GLUT4 hex slash hexokinase. It's like a 20 to 30% decrease in flux. And again, that's from the buildup of citrate. But with carbs, what happens is these enzymes, ATP citrate lyase and acetyl CoA carboxylase, get turned on. So the citrate can flow to acetyl CoA and into malonyl CoA. Whereas with fats, this doesn't happen. So fats don't inhibit fatty acid um, oxidation in the mitochondria. Fats inhibit, they don't, fatty acid build up with citrate doesn't lead to a buildup of malonyl CoA. So fats aren't inhibiting themselves. Um, that's, that's not at least the mechanisms that are described by these different re authors or these different researchers and Randall, et cetera. And then with glucose, glucose isn't in really heavily in, it's not really inhibiting its uptake at all, despite what the first quote said that I read what's through phosphofructose fructose kinase one and two, because the citrate doesn't really build up. So what's happening is not that Glucose comes through and then citrate builds up, moves to the cytosol, and then the then the citrate blocks phosphor fructose kinase 1 and subsequently backlogs the hexokinase. That's not happening. What's happening is glucose flows through, moves nicely through the citric acid cycle, and then moves and then creates the electron carriers, and there's not that altered ratio of NADH and FADH2 and subsequent altered ratio of NADH to NAD+. Plus in the electron transport chain, that you're not seeing that happen with glucose. It moves very nicely. It flows nicely. And then any citrate that does escape is flowing to malonyl CoA. So glucose doesn't block itself. And as I said, fats don't block themselves really either. That's not how this works. And I'm going to talk about those, the specific mechanisms. So first things first, we're going to talk about is the regulation of citrate eventual conversion to malonyl CoA at the enzyme ATP citrate lyase. So citrate here is ultimately converted to malonyl CoA. But we're going to talk about what happens or how is this regulated at this enzyme here, ATP citrate lyase, that initially converts citrate to acetyl-CoA. So I have a quote for you. They say, since uptake and oxidation of free fatty acids is increased in the heart in the fasted state, long-chain fatty acyl-CoA levels should rise and free, uh, this is coenzyme A, and free coenzyme A should fall in the cytosol. The lower cytosolic coenzyme A levels could decrease citrate removal by limiting ATP citrate lyase and thus permit citrate to accumulate in this compartment and inhibit phosphofructose kinase. Upon return to the, fed, to the fed state, the rate of delivery of free fatty acids to the heart from adipose tissue decreases, resulting indirectly in an elevation of heart cytosolic CoA levels. Citrate can now be converted to acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate by ATP citrate lyase. Now, if your fed state is a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, this isn't, this isn't relevant to you because you're still going to just increase the amount of free fatty acids that you're oxidizing. So they kind of leave out an important point here. So I have a graph to show you guys to describe this. So when fat, so here you have, this is the cell membrane. This is the cytosol. This is the mitochondria. You have fatty acids. That's the FA here are moved through these different receptors, CD36 and FABP. So that brings fatty acids into the cytosol of the cell. And then acetyl-CoA is combined with the fatty acids through acetyl-CoA synthetase and forms acyl-CoA. Now, that's great. No problem, right? Well, that's not good news for ATP citrate lyase. Why? So we're going to get to this next slide here. ATP citrate lyase, this enzyme here, takes citrate, combines it with coenzyme A, and combines it with ATP, the ATP is bound to magnesium, to form oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA plus magnesium bound to ADP. 
which is just a, uh, ATP without the phosphate, so the, inner, the phosphate molecules here. So what happens when fatty acids are hogging all of this CoA um, to form these acyl CoAs to go to, to basically you need the, the carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1 requires the fatty acids to have an acyl CoA attached to them for them to enter the mitochondrium. So the, the fatty acids are stealing all this coenzyme A and an ATP citrate lyase doesn't have the necessary amount of coenzyme A for it to function. So when you have this fatty acid oxidation, the long chain fatty acyl CoAs here have all of the CoA and the ATP citrate lyase that needs this CoA to convert citrate to acetyl CoA, well, it's kind of, it's SOL, it's kind of shit out of luck. It doesn't have the, the coenzyme A necessary to convert the citrate to acetyl CoA. So this fatty acid oxidation blocks uh, ATP citrate lyase function because of that lack of coenzyme A. So you're not going to see citrate move to malonyl CoA during fatty acid oxidation because it's blocked at acyl, uh, ATP citrate lyase. And it's also blocked at acetyl CoA carboxylase, but we'll get to that in just a second. So with carb oxidation, the carbs aren't taking the coenzyme A groups as, as it creates pyruvate. That happens inside the mitochondria. The CoA is needed at pyruvate dehydrogenase. So with when, when you're bringing glucose into the cytosol, when the citrate escapes, the fatty acids aren't taking the, the coenzyme A anymore. So ATP citrate lyase is, has enough coenzyme A in the cytosol to convert the cytosolic citrate to the acetyl-CoA. So the enzyme becomes unblocked in carb oxidation, which is great. And the, this is why... This is why carb oxidation it allows citrate to move through and isn't blocking, isn't blocking carb oxidation and where, why fat oxidation isn't having the citrate convert to malonyl CoA because the ATP citrate lyase is blocked during fat oxidation. So they're not inhibiting themselves. They're, hit, they're inhibiting each other um, depending on which one is being oxidized inside the mitochondria. That's the, that is the whole premise of the Randall cycle um, whether, the, for either substrate. Now, Something else I want to talk about, ATP, uh, acetyl-CoA carboxylase is the second enzyme here, and this is heavily regulated as well. Now, there's a lot of hormonal regulation in it, but it's also regulated by citrate. So citrate activates acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And I'm going to have some quotes to show you guys. So you don't have to take my word for it. I have all the studies, as you can see, linked below. So if you want to see them, you can check them out. Um, I'll drop them in the description as well. Excuse me. But we're going to talk about some of the regulations here. And this is where it gets interesting because the there's genetic and there's hormonal switches on top of the mitochondrial mechanics and the cytosolic mechanics. So you have like this huge system of regulation that's constantly sensing the energetic state of the cell and which substrate is being oxidized and then adjusting enzymatic function uh, like accordingly. So it's, it's like a very beautiful system and it's soup. It gets way more in depth than just these mechanics at the mitochondria or inside the cell. Cause you have to talk about like, what are these hormonal effects? What is insulin, glucagon, epinephrine, cortisol? What do these different things do? What are they signaling to the cell? What, why are they being upregulated? And that's where like the th Randall cycle part three it, that's what I want to focus on when I get in that when I create that video. It's going to take a little more research than these two, but there's like a, there's a whole level there's multiple levels of of regulation where the the cells are basically saying, "Hey, like we don't have enough glucose, right? Let's oxidize fatty acids." And then it like turn down all the all of the glucose oxidation in these other cells and then allow that glucose to be used for the central nervous system. It's a, quite a beautiful adaptive response and it like may, it makes quite a bit of sense but it's just a very like getting through all the minute details and whatnot it is a bit extensive so with that said we're going to talk about regulation of malonyl coa so the formation of malonyl coa at acetyl coa carboxylase so that is this enzyme here acetyl coa carboxylase so what they say here is glucagon rapidly inactivates acetyl coa carboxylase with an accompanying fourfold increase in the phosphorylation of the enzyme and a threefold increase in the pro protomer polymer ratio of enzyme protein. So basically, they're just saying that glucagon inactivates acetyl CoA carboxylase by phosphorylating the enzyme, um, adding phosphate groups to it, turns the enzyme off. Um, the citrate, an allosteric activator of acetyl CoA carboxylase required for enzyme activity, has no effect on these phenomena, indicating a mechanism that's independent of citrate concentration within the cell. So 
or upregulation of glucagon by itself is going to signal is going to deactivate acetylcholine carboxylase even if citrate is building up in the cell why is this so important because glucagon is basically signaling to the body hey we don't have enough glucose on board we need to produce glucose and when it does that it's saying all right, well, we're not going to take our fats and turn them into triglycerides for storage. We're going to turn off acetyl-CoA carboxylase. We're going to not form any more of this malonyl-CoA here. And then thus, with that said, carnitine palmitotransferase 1 doesn't get blocked anymore. So that we're going to say, hey, hey cells, we're going to start oxidizing fatty acids. So this enzyme gets blocked when the body has when the body produces glucagon, which is a signal saying, hey, we don't have enough glucose. And it's saying, hey, we, well, let's stop tape forming this malonyl-CoA. Let's stop turning our fats into triglycerides. Now it's time to start burning them. Now it's time to start oxidizing them. So without the malonyl-CoA, booms, carnitine palmitoyl transferase 1, unblocked. Um, other thing that they mention here that's important is that citrate itself stimulates acetyl-CoA carboxylase. Now you say, hey, if you have fatty acid oxidation and it's building up citrate, shouldn't it stimulate acetyl-CoA carboxylase? Not necessarily, in, or no, actually, because in any state that you have fatty acid oxidation going on like that, you're probably going to have an upregulation of glucagon, um, AMP kinase, which we'll talk about in just a sec, and, and other hormones uh, like adrenaline or epinephrine because the fatty acids are liberated by those hormones. And when fatty acids are being oxidized by that, What's ascent, or when fatty acids are being oxidized, usually it's a state of 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 decreased glucose. So the cells aren't oxidizing glucose, um, and essentially it's that's going to upregulate. You're in that state, you usually have the glucagon upregulation, and then the liberation of fats with adrenaline. And those hormones are going to turn off this acetyl CoA carboxylase. You'll also usually have a decreased amount of insulin. Now, in states of diabetes and metabolic dysregulation. There's a whole bunch of things going on where you have like upregulated insulin and glucocorticoid signaling and glucagon and adrenaline. Uh, so there's like multiple things going on that are quite problematic and that leads to skews in the signaling. But in normal situations, if you were to heavily, if you were starving, if you were eating a high fat, low carb diet, if in, in either of those, if you were fasting in any of those situations, if you had fatty acid oxidation going on, you would also have a concomitant increase even if it's within the reference range or of signaling of the adrenaline or, or, or norepinephrine the increase in glucagon you would have most likely an increase in ampk ketogenic diets are like known for the increase in ampk and the ampk the glucagon the adrenaline would all turn off acetyl CoA carboxylase and what they're saying in that study is regardless of whether citrate is there, they say citrate and allosteric activator of acetyl CoA carboxylase required for enzyme activity has no effect on these phenomenon, indicating a mechanism that's independent of citrate concentration within the cell. So those hormones that are generally upregulated with fatty acid oxidation, again, will shut down acetyl CoA carboxylase regardless of the citrate buildup in the cytosol from fatty acid oxidation. Now, next piece is insulin. I'm going to read this here. Insulin stimulates fatty acid synthesis in adipose and other tissues by increasing acetyl-CoA carboxylase activity in epididymal fat cells and liver cells. This activation is associated with increased phosphorylation of enzymes at specific sites, particularly within a peptide designated uh, L-peptide. Uh, this is this last part's not as important. Basically, insulin stimulates fatty acid synthesis by increasing acetyl-CoA carboxylase. It also does this in liver cells and epididymal fat cells. Um, now, the other thing is increase in cytosolic citrate leading to an increase in the concentration of malonyl CoA occur when a muscle is presented with insulin and glucose or when it is made inactive by denervation in keeping with a diminished need for fatty acid oxidation in these situations. So just showing that insulin, glucose, and then a lack of required for substrate, particularly in muscle cells, decreases fatty acid oxidation and it increases the movement of those fatty acids to storage through the upregulation of malonyl CoA. So malonyl CoA is that switch where glucose oxidation or carbohydrate oxidation basically turns off fatty acid oxidation and says, hey, we're in an anabolic state. We can take these this these fats and we can convert those fats into into triglycerides and store them. So insulin is an anabolic hormone. Insulin or and glucose is anabolic and it by and by nature of this, it's basically inhibiting the breakdown of all these other things, decreasing the need for glucagon, etc. 
so that because you have this exogenous source coming in. And that's something really important to keep in mind in terms of like understanding that the insulin and the glucose are having a building effect on the body. And that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to make you fat. Um, and I'll talk about that in other podcasts it's kind of, or YouTube videos. It's kind of besides the point here. The last piece I wanted to touch on about acetyl-CoA carboxylase is the importance of AMPK. So AMPK, I'm just, I put a little quote here to describe it for you guys. So AMPK is activated by metabolic stresses, such as a decrease in substrate supply, glucose or oxygen deprivation, or an increase in energy demand exercise. Both increase the ratio of AMP to ATP. Also changes in calcium or calcium ions can also activate AMPK independently of adenine nucleotide changes. Now the calcium piece is important to keep in mind here because generally calcium release inside cells is a signal for decreased energy. Um, it's a feature of mitochondrial dysfunction. It's also a signal for uh, muscular contraction, things along those lines, which would use energy. So calcium, calcium ion signaling in the cells tied very strongly with mitochondrial function and also energy, energy state of the cell, which is why it could increase AMPK. There's definitely more nuances to discuss there um, beyond the scope of, of what we're talking about here, but just something interesting to keep in mind. Now, the other thing to talk about is AMP to ATP ratio. So ATP is the final product that we get out of the Krebs cycle electron transport chain, out of oxidative phosphorylation. And ATP is what we're, that is the energy substrate of the cell. That's what we're looking to produce with food. Now, ATP is adenosine triphosphate. So it's adenosine molecule with three phosphates attached. AMP is adenosine monophosphate. So it's adenosine with one phosphate group. Now, why is AMP to ATP ratio a signal of metabolic stress? Well, when ATP gets used, it gets turned to ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So it has two phosphate groups attached. If that ADP is further used or that phosphate group is further removed, you'll get the formation of AMP, adenosine monophosphate. Again, now you have one phosphate group attached. And what this is signaling is that the cell has used a large portion of its ATP, and then that st stimulates the AMPK, um, the ad uh, adenosine monophosphate kinase, um, which basically saying, Hey, cell, we're, we don't have adequate amounts of energy. So with that in mind, and this is where I'm talking about like the genetic controls that get involved with this now. So what winds up happening and they talk about it here is PKA or AMP dependent protein kinases, same thing as AMP kinase was first reported to phosphorylate and inactivate liver acetyl-CoA carboxylase, thereby decreasing malonyl-CoA concentration and explaining the stimulation of fatty acid oxidation and ketogenesis by glucagon in the liver. AMPK phosphorylates and inactivates both acetyl-CoA carboxylase isoforms. So AMPK also turns off acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So when the cell says, hey, we don't have enough energy, we we're using our ATP like crazy and we're getting this buildup of AMP. All right, well, let's stop storing fats in this state. We need to stop doing that and we need to start oxidizing fats. So it starts to, again, fatty acid oxidation in like in the general context is in states of lack of, of, of uh, glucose supply. So when you don't have enough glycogen, when you haven't eaten an for a period of time, say you're starvation or you're fasting or you're not eating adequate carbohydrate, fatty acid oxidation is going to rule. And it's basically saying to the body, hey, we don't have enough. We don't, we're energy poor to some extent. Um, the reason why is the fatty acids are the backup fuel to a large extent. They're used whenever glucose isn't present. And they're also used when in states of starvation or in stress. So both starvation and stress are characterized by increases in fatty acid oxidation. And in states of extreme stress, which Jay and I have talked about in an article before, you can have a 200% increase in metabolism, such as if you have an infection or you're in the ICU or you have a trauma or anything along those lines. And it's characterized by an increase largely in fatty acid oxidation. So fatty acid oxidation and something that we'll talk, I guess I'll talk about in the future, there's going to be a lot more research to go into it, but it's kind of like a, and I guess part of the bioenergetic view is that the fatty acid oxidation is a, is a signal of stress because stress is characterized by this fatty acid oxidation. The metabolic syndrome, diabetes, cancer are all states characterized 
by alterations in this fatty acid oxidation with with upregulations in them, and then the and then that affects glucose oxidation in other ways. And actually, I think Hate It just posted a really interesting article. I recommend everybody check it out. It's kind of in depth, but talking about cancer metabolism um, as an increase in beta oxidation, and then they talk about the beta oxidation shuttle, which is a little theory that the researchers in that paper in that paper discuss. But that's another interesting paper to go over and talk about with cancer metabolism. I'll probably get to that in the future, but again, more research is going to be needed for that. So. That's essentially the the Randall cycle part two. It's covering the the glucose oxidation inhibiting fatty acid oxidation. We went through the mitochondrial mechanisms. We went through the cytosolic mechanisms. We went through the different regulation or some of the regulatory elements on the different enzymes. So hopefully you guys can get a better understanding of what's happening in the Randall cycle on either part. And then I guess look forward to part three. I don't know when it's going to come out. I'm probably going to do some different things in between so I don't get too inundated with Randall cycle. But part three, I'm going to try to cover more about AMPK, insulin, uh, epinephrine, glucagon, etc., and their alterations to some extent. Uh, there's also different things like uh, PPAR alpha or PPAR gamma um, and different genetic elements that regulate this glucose versus fatty acid oxidation as well. I do need to do quite a bit more research to fully understand it. So I'm going to put that together in the future. That'll be a project. Maybe when I'm not working in the hospital as much. So stay tuned for that. In the meantime, I'm going to try and cover some things on fructose, cover some things on the bore effect. Um, so yeah, keep keep it out for that. And then maybe some. there's also some studies on caloric restriction I want to cover as well and also heart disease. So stay posted, guys. I don't know which ones are going to come out first. I kind of just go on what, I, what I'm interested in doing. And uh, hope you liked the video. I'll see you guys in the next one.